Quick ducks. You're looking at where they sit in the water and how they shit, sit. Sorry. <laughs> we all know that. Yeah. Some, some are, are quite broad and bobbly. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm really in trouble now. That went live, didn't it? Can you cut that? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I like this. Um, you, you're looking at the, the profile of the head and bill in particular. The, the, the shape and size of the bill, the strength of the, the bill is really important. And the tail, the tail feathers, particularly in the diving ducks, are very distinctive. And then it, it's about where you get colour through, through. And in this case, we're looking at quite a bland bird, but we've got a distinct peak on, on the head. We've got a really distinctive bill, that broad start, and you can even see that little point in the tip of the bill. It's a freckled duck, which are, are, are quite a, an uncommon bird. They, they have periods where they increase in number. They rely on big inland floods and, and they need um, water under their nest for, for quite a, a few months be, in order to breed successfully. And so they, they really nest in very dense vegetation that's surrounded by water on those floodplains. No. When, when, they, when you get the floods, amazingly, a lot of birds just disappear up north to those floods. And, and so they, they're breeding during that period. And then they disperse out as the inland dries out or as the, the big floods dry out, dry out. They disperse out into the, the fringing parts of Australia and, and you get them in the wetlands right around the edge. Ah, yes. Ah, yes, that's true. Yeah, we, we, it probably was. Okay, so we, we've got the freckled duck and, and it's a female. Um, and, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about the male again later. Okay. Could be. Could be. Well, you, you would have found the Greaves page today. Great crested Greaves. Sorry, there's a couple of words in the, in the name, but it was a crested word. Yep, well done. Notice the colouring of the feathers. So the white ones, they're just low levels of melanin. The black ones are you melanin. And then you've got the brown ones. Not all of them, but yeah. Yep. These ones, you, you don't see them flying around that often, but when they're in their um, pairs and they're going through their mating dances, they're just the most amazing birds on the water. You see those spectacular mating dances. They um, build a nest that floats out on the, wa um, the water side of reeds, and then when the young are, are hatched, you'll see them often on the backs of the birds, swimming around, sitting on the backs. And they're quite spectacular young. They really have distinctive colouring and black and white barring all across the body. What do you think those breeds were in on them? Yabbies, they, they, they will take yabbies, although smaller ones. I, I, I saw one catch a, uh, a big yabby up in uh, Kalitan, up in Victoria once and it came up with this monster and it fought it for about an hour. The first 20 minutes or so was it clipped off the two big claws and then it each time it dropped it, went down, got it again, brought it back up. Then it started munching it a bit in the beak and then it finally got it, threw it up and it actually just 
stuck. It, would, it was too big. <laughs> it wouldn't get down the throat. And it, it did in the end get it uh, down, I think, but it took a lot of crunching and crushing and, and so on. But softening up, yeah. But they... They, they would take everything from um, little uh, insects like the, the larvae of um, dragonflies and that through to uh, small fish and, and yeah, yabbies and things like that. Okay, so we've got the great crested grebe. Everyone's... And that, they're, they're really spectacular birds. You get them on bigger bodies of water. Um, you see them every now and then on big swamps, places like that. Where about? Big swamp. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> no, not a shag. <laughs> but they used to be called shags, but... That's from the, the English shag, which is closely related, but slightly different from the cormorant. But yeah, common name for it is shag. Now, five types of cormorants that we get around here. Two of them are black, and two of them are black and uh, three of them are black and white. So the first thing you ask is, is it all body black, or is it white on the belly and black on the back? So that, that's the two major groups you have split them into. And then you look at the head, and you're looking at the amount of colour on the head. So which page have we got cormorants on? 122. 122. Are people starting to use the front page of the book to find the group quickly? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Inside the cover. Oh, there. The, the front half is non passerines and the back half is a few non passerines and then all the passerines. So we'll we'll be looking at the non passerines tonight. Great cormorant. Yeah. So you've got the yellow, quite distinctive. The white, it doesn't go through under the eye like it does to the little pied and, and things like that. And if you look at the little black, which is the other all black bird, the little black cormorant, what do you notice about its head? All black. So if you're seeing colouring in the head and it's all black, then it's the great, which is a bigger bird anyway. But if it's a long way away, sometimes size is not obvious. If you're seeing just an all black head, then it's the, the little black. So great cormorant. And the other one I'll put in just because they're around this part of the world. There's two groups that you need to check with quail. There's quails and there's button quail. They're separate. If you've got an old book, the quail and the button quail will be on the same page. If you've got a new book, the quail will be at the front and the button quail will be in the middle because they're quite distinct from each other. Yep. <laughs> when they fly away, if you see them well, you'll see the quail have a one-tone wing. If you see the button quail, 
as they fly off or, or just before they prop up to land, you'll see they have a two-tone wing. So that, that's a cue for the ones around this part of the world, whether they're button quail or quail. This has got a one-tone wing, so it's a quail. And then looking at it closely, you can see quite distinctive markings on the feathers <coughs> and around the head. They have a really distinctive call and if you're out in your paddocks all across EP, you'll hear this, pick the wheat. All through the wheat fields, <coughs> all through the different paddocks. It's not the internet, it's a, an app. So shouldn't have to. Now I can. Yep. Because you haven't switched on before. Yep. I'll, I'll play you one later that half the room won't hear. Badly. But that pick the wheat, you, you'll hear that and it, if you get that little mnemonic in your head, you'll always recognise it. All across EP, quite common, yeah. Uh, there's, there's two apps. I'll talk about them over the next few weeks if you're interested. Um, there's, there's those two apps there. Um, but yeah, so this one's a stubble quail. Okay, now... Often heard, or heard more often than it's seen, usually in deep in reed beds. And we get a lot more of them recorded on EP, I'm sure, if people knew their call. No? Does anyone know what group it's in? No. It's in that crate group. Rails, yep. So it's in the crakes and rails. You'll find that book fails you all the time. You really need to be using one of these. So um, I'll get you one. So it, it has the major ones, but when, there's, when you think there's 300 odd birds on EP, it, it, yeah. No, no, it's not the Lewins. Okay, this is one you'll be near a wetland in reed beds or it'll be thick veg around the edge of a, a wetland and you'll hear this call. And I would have recorded, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 of these around the, the lakes um, when I was doing surveys there, but I reckon I saw two of them. So most of them you're going to have to recognise by call. They're not going to come out in the open. If they do come out in the open and you're lucky and you see them, they'll give a tail flick if they're alert to your presence. And if you look at the banding on the tail, that's quite distinctive. Um, but most of the time, you're not going to see them. So the call becomes critical. And you might be down along the Todd River or around the 
Todd Reservoir, places like that. Might be your dam at home with a little bit of reed bed at one end and you hear this call, go, go and check it out. It's not going to come out and let you see it unless you, yeah, very shy, very cryptic. So buff banded rail. The juvenile is much plainer but beware of them and we're going to go through quite a few of these little cryptic birds in reed beds and things like that tonight. Just make sure you're aware of the different calls and start to go and investigate. Think about the feathers, primaries, the secondaries, the covets. Yeah. So in your ducks, early in the, what was it, 24 or something onwards? I'm sure you all know the the tongue twister. How much wood would a wood duck chuck? <laughs> they they breed. A lot of ducks breed in the trees, yeah, in hollows in trees. They mostly eat grass, so our dams that we've put in across our farms all across southern and eastern Australia have done these guys the world of good. So typically you'll have a pair or two pairs around your, your dam and they'll have six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven chicks running around behind them. Um, they've done very well. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they do that broken wing behaviour to drag you away. A few things to notice though, that the size of that bill is much different from, from the first duck we're looking at and, and the ones that we look at as, as we move. It's a bit hard with that photo though because it's going away. It is now. flying away, yeah. All looks foreshortened. But Australian wood duck. Yep. How about this guy? Another one that you, you're not going to see very often. And when you do see it, you're not going to see that brown and grey. It just, it's, it's going to look like a black bird. You'll hear that this call coming out of the reed beds. Yeah, it is. This is another call they make. No. And their little contact call. No. No, Bill's all wrong, wrong habitat. So it's sort of It's a crake, yes. Look up your crakes. Um, now it's going to get your 
third book. You're working in that one? <laughs> yeah. This is one of those funny names that suggests there's another craig called the Spotted Craig, <laughs> which looks very similar, of course. So if you see it out in the open and you can see the two tones, the brown and the grey, it, it, it's quite in, distinctive. But it's typically either on the edge of reeds in the shadows or right in the middle of the reeds. And again, it's another one of those ones where I recorded hundreds of them in reed beds and I had them crawling around my feet but I wasn't seeing them. They're really, really cryptic, really hard to see. The spotless crake, you've all got that one? Yep. The call again. And if you hear that really neat advertising call, So you get the <laughs> and then <laughs> yeah and you get them on EP that I don't know they're just not recorded very often so start to Think and listen around those reed beds. Around oh, shrill machine gun sugar. <laughs> yep. So your Vietnam vet hits the ground right beside you. You know what's going on. Yeah. Okay. See the tail? That's typical of the diving ducks. They have that tail with, with lots of feathers all raked around like a comb. The name comes from the odour that they have, which is very must-like. Apparently when they were first caught, the, the ship smelt of, of this musk for a long time. So that's not a very pleasant smell? I don't imagine it is, no. I've never had one in the hand. Male's got a huge, big um, skin underneath the, the bill. And this is a female. You, you see them in twos, threes, fours. In, in, in fairly in the deeper wetlands, they they'll stay there for months and then they just disappear. Like a lot of these birds, they fly overnight, so they'll move out, and and you won't see them moving overnight. And after the young are born, they hang around with the female. If ever you get to see them. Um, during the mating period, depending the territories, the males do this really weird thing across the water, and it, it's it's very obvious. Um, let me play the call for you. You'll hear this out in the wetlands. All quite distinctive, but like all of the non passerines or nearly all of them, the call is simple. It's a, it's a whistle or it's a, a honk or it's a plonk or something, you know. But it's when we get into the passerines later on that the complexity of the calls really increases. Do you see these in groups or just one or two? Or one or two or threes or fours, yes. Yeah. Um, if you, I, I see, I've seen a lot of them at the um, Cleve. Dam up behind Cleve there, or you get them on Big Swamp and Little Swamp and yep. places like that. Yeah. Get them out. Get them out in the um, 
in the bays as well sometimes. Okay, so must duck. Yeah, it's blown up pretty big. Yep. Yep, we, we've got to tease the herons apart from the egrets. Apart from, we don't get the storks down here, but we're in that part of the world. No, no. No. The, it, it's, um, it's much, no, no. No. Look at the white just around the face. The white's just around the face, and the other thing is, on the wings, it's two tones. It's got the primaries and secondaries are black, and then the covets, the underwing covets, are lighter. And the one that you might confuse it with is the white neck heron. That's the one you should be looking at. The white face here. Yeah. Notice them in flight. They show two different tones under the wing. No. Yeah, the colour's not the best. It's not the best photo, but you're not going to see these so close very often. They typically take off from the wetland as you come towards it. Or well, they're on the other side. But they're very common all through here. And on EP they, they get into big groups. You often see them out in paddocks and there might be 30, 40, 50 of them together. Which I haven't seen down south very much but you see up north the, the bigger groups. Yeah, so white-faced heron, but you get lots of them, particularly down this southern AP over winter, right, right through the region. White-faced heron. Your favourite. A lot of people over here call them mountain ducks, which is what I used, to, what I grew up calling them. Yeah. Shell duck. Yeah. And what? What's the sex? Yeah. What's next? Yeah. Uh, which is the one that's going out? <laughs> the arrow. Is that yeah, yeah. Which one? No, no. You've got to have your year 10 brain working. Okay, year 10 boy. And you've got to think about that arrow. And that's the end of it. That's a boy. And the year 10 girl is the cross. And that's about it. You're looking at the white around the eye? Yeah. And the white on the beak? Can you see a difference? Yeah. The male doesn't have the white around the eye and the white across the top of the beak. The female. You can pick that. They're, they're a call that you I associate with wetlands in Australia. 
particularly at night if you camp by a wetland. It's a common call. Uh, and this is a group of them taking off. That, that, that brings back lots of memories, that call. Yeah. Okay. So, Australian shell duck? Oh, well, they're protected always, but then in some seasons you can shoot, yeah. Notice that it's really not floating. It's, it's a neutral density. It, its body is in the water, which is why it can do what it does. It can sit down there and chase after fish. And unlike the cormorants, which catch the fish in the beak often, these guys actually stab the fish. So you'll see them, you'll see them come up to the surface and they'll flick the fish in the air and catch it. that they actually use that strike into the fish with the beak. Probably not a heap. You usually... Yeah? They're, they're quite a, a big bird. So, and, and Yeah? Um, okay. Yeah, and there was a group of them together. Right. Okay. Oh, I'm, I'm intrigued. Yeah, it, you you do get them in, in larger numbers. Have a look at the data. They're they're, they're classic birds sitting on the branch on the Murray, you know, the, the wings out drying. On the foreshore. Yeah. I'm wondering what... Okay. Okay. I, I haven't seen many... I haven't seen many around on EP, but they are here. I just... Yeah. The, um, it could have been one of the cormorants, but... We'll, we'll have a look at a few in a minute and see what you reckon. Then, because of this, if you've seen them on a river or a lake when they're like this, they look like a snake on the water. So a lot of people call them snake birds. But they're, they're a data, Australasian data. What's the age of that one? Juvenile. The, the adults have quite a colourful head. It's quite distinctive. Yeah, males and females. So that's a young one. Which group? No. Egret, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, the trouble with photos is that just one view of it, and when when you get all the, the that need for the the, the diagrams. How do you know it's not the intermediate? How do you know it's the great egret? No. Oh, I thought it was the breeding plumage of the intermediate. If you take the neck and straighten it out and compare the length of the neck to the length of the body, what do you reckon it would be? Shorter than the body, the same length as the body or longer than the body? Longer. And if you look at that, you should be able to pick them at a kilometre or two. It's a great egret <coughs> because you're looking at the length of the neck compared to the length of the body. If you get a closer look, 
Can you see a bit of skin coming around under the eye? Notice that it goes right back behind the eye. Now, these birds have had a tough time in Australia because typically they require about six months of water under their nest before they breed successfully. So six months of water under a nest takes a long, solid flood. And what we've taken out of our flood system, Murray, Darling, that sort of part of the world, is those big, long floods. And if the water drops rapidly underneath the nest, they'll abandon it or if the water doesn't last at least two or three months, they won't even get to the point with hormones and everything else and the food production that happens with a flooded river that they can start to breed. So these are birds that haven't done as well as they might in, in the southern parts of Australia because of the way we manage our river systems. And particularly with the intermediate egret, that needs nine months of water under its nest. Is that, so, the, is that the intermediate? This is the great. So, the so colouring of, of the beak, but can you see that bit of skin going right back behind the eye there? Yeah, no, except that the great egret is usually black, except for breeding. Except for breeding, goes, goes yellow. Yellow. That's orange. Oh, well, yeah. Little, little egret. I mean, the intermediate egret, be all orange or red. So I would have gone straight to intermediate. No, no, definitely not. So if you go, um, uh, for example, Thompson's Beach or a lot of our bays around here, but Thompson's Beach, south, um, north of Adelaide, you might get two, three, four hundred of these right along the beach. You can stand there and scan right down the beach. As far as you see, they'll be right out across the mudflats, really quite common. And you can pick them by the length of that neck compared to the body. Bill colour and leg colour and that can be helpful. So what do they eat? They eat all sorts of um, insects through small fish, through yeah, even yabbies and things like that. There's a lot of crabs at Thompson's Beach, isn't there? Yeah, probably have a go at them too. Okay, so great egret, eastern great egret. Now, back to the ducks. Where's that? Front of the book. How do you know it's not a female chestnut teal? Yep, that, that's what it, it's all about. Yeah, we, we need you to be going away in 10 weeks' time knowing that book. Why is it a grey teal? It's got a red eye. The brown eye up closer to its eye, whereas on the chestnut teal it goes down lower the cheek. No, the brown, the, on the chestnut teal, the female, it, it's brown above, around the eye as well. What's the difference? It's, it's, it's not the top that you're looking at, no, it's the contrast. Yeah, so. Yeah, this bit from the eye down around the neck is white compared to dark at the top. And if you're looking at the female of the chestnut teal, it's much dirtier. It's not a clean white, it's a dirtier black white. When you look at them out across a, a, a swamp or whatever, you'll see the male chestnut teals and you'll see the female chestnut teals. Have a closer look. There'll be a lot of grey teals, probably as many typically as the, the chestnut teals. And what you're looking for is that contrast between the top of the head and, and the bottom of the head. It also looks like yeah, white. Yeah, the... the the, the top of the body and, and, and the feathers on the belly, it, 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 it's not something you're going to be able to identify them by. So you've got to actually just look at the head and, and you can scan across with your scope or with, with your binoculars and you can actually count the grey teal versus the female of the chestnut teal. It, it's, it's possible to do it 
and you've just got to concentrate on it for a while and you'll start to see the differences, particularly on a sunny day. So there's your grey teal. That's your chestnut teal. Notice it, it's much darker through there. It's still got the contrast, but this is dirtier. You won't always see that. That can often be covered up with feathers. Yeah, so there's your female chestnut teal. If you put them side by side, it's that contrast that we're really after. Okay? Everything else, the, the way in which you've got the edge, the margin of the feather is white. That's present in both. And, and the amount of darkness in the feather. The, the, the breast might be a little bit different, but you're not going to pick that when they're sitting in the water at a long way away. So you need to be able to look at those two parts and compare them and get, get the idea into your head and you'll be able to pick them. And they're probably our two most common birds that you'll see. Oh, and down the railway dam and go north, I'll set them there down there. And when they got into the light, the white part was reflecting back in the water. Yeah. And it's not that hard to work out what they were, really. Okay. Because there was another thing there that was nearly all white, like a duck. Okay. So I don't know what the hell it was. But nearly all white. Yeah. 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 Blackout showed up in the water. <laughs> now. <laughs> He's probably had a few already. Okay, so grey teal and the female chestnut teal. Trickier ones to tell apart, but you can do it. And, and people can get confused if they start to look for other things. So do, do teach yourself. Yep. So the question was, is it a pied, black and white, or is it all black? If it's all black, where do we look? But is it pied, is it black and white, white underneath, black on top? No, it's not. There's two types of black cormorants. If one's got colour on its face and the other one hasn't, you should be able to pick it quickly. So it's a great cormorant. So there's your great cormorant. Three heading earlier, didn't you? Yep. I'm allowed to repeat things. Yep. Yeah. You get these, they can get up into really big groups and they're quite spectacular to watch. You, you can have thousands. I've been in amongst thousands in the Gippsland Lakes in Victoria and they're all diving and catching and they're herding the fish as a group moving through the water. Really quite amazing. Um, but what's the key thing that you're seeing? Blackhead. There's no colour there. Yep. So you can pick cormorant, you can pick all black and then it's about colour. Yeah, they do. But because of the way in which tunery, for example, are fed out here, we get some pretty big flocks of, of greats as well. Yeah. So little blacks. This guy? These are really interesting because they're a marine species. A lot of our cormorants, you get them marine, but you, they're mostly found through the freshwater systems, the rivers, the lakes. Yeah, I reckon it's a cormorant. And I'd be calling it one of these. I reckon it is. No. Yeah, no, I reckon that's what it is. So one of these guys. If it's a pied cormorant, once you've worked out it's a pied, you then look at the head. 
Has it got white coming through between the eye and the bill? Has it got colour on its face? Or is it just black and white? Black and white. So we've got three. And this is the black face. So this is the marine species. And Air Peninsula seems to be a real um, key centre for, for the population in Australia. And very big numbers. Yep. So black faced versus the other two pied. You've, you've got three pied species and the black face versus the other two. And you can see why it's the black face. Yep. No colour, no white up through. Was it smaller than the pied cormorant? Yeah, not much though. About 10 centimetres. So if you look at them side by side. It's a pied at the front, yeah. And then, can you see the white through the top here? Yeah. And the size? Oh, no, little pie. And then behind yeah, it? Looks like a, black face. a black face. Yeah, so there they are, side by side. I managed to get three together. I, what I didn't oh. manage to do was get them in focus. Don't you hate that? <laughs> and of course, they immediately moved, and that was it. But I was, I was quite happy about that. They, they were a very long way away on a rock, so. But it does, most of the time nowadays I'm thinking about the bird course, so I didn't have this in the first or second year. So there's your pied at the front, quite distinctive, and you can see the comparison in size. They're not that much different in size when you look at them side by side. The, the pied is a bit bigger, but not much. Then there's the little pied, which is distinctively smaller. And then there's the black faced. And you get all five here on, on Air Peninsula. So Another one of those ones that is heard and seldom seen. But it's not the adult. Yeah. Can you see the juvenile there? Yeah. So you hear this call out of reed beds, but not often recorded, again, because it's not often seen, so we need to know the call. Bailin's Creek. Bailin's yep. Bailin's Creek. Juvenile. Juvenile. That's right, that's right. You, you can take this home and, and um, if you bring a flash drive, I, yeah. I'll, I'm happy to give you a copy yeah. and no take it home and go through it again. Nice, wasn't it? Yeah. Flash drive. Sorry. That's, that's right. Like US yeah. yeah. yeah.
Where's the white in the wing? On the shoulder. On the Not the shoulder. What part of the wing is that? The wrist, yeah, the wrist of the, the wing. And it's which covert? That's it, yeah. So it's right up the top and it's even those, the next layer uh, uh, around. So if you, if you go back here, uh, looking on your wing, you've got those lessers and then right at the very front, you've got those marginal covets as well. Yep, see this. When you look at them flying off, if you don't get a good look at that white neck, if it's a dull day or they're going the wrong direction, if you look under the wing, it, unlike the white-faced heron, which has two tones or more, you, you just get the one tone under the wing. So, white necked heron, all good? Yep. Which group? Uh, uh, Egrets. Egrets, good. What do you notice about the leg and the bill colour? The sear. What do you notice about the feathers coming off the back? And the feathers coming off the head? Breathing plumes, yep. Get those beautiful, fine, lacy feathers on the back. Quite spectacular. You don't see them initially, usually. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, it, it would be about the length of the body, yeah. But the bill and the leg colour helps you a lot there. And then, when you start to see that, which you won't see straight away, because it might be flat or it might be just the light or whatever, and then suddenly you get a good look at it. And You see it in the book? In the breeding plumage. So it's a little egret. Yeah, as you go through the books, you'll see things that are strengths and weaknesses. I, I like all sorts of elements of books. But the thing I like only about this book that makes it better is it's more modern. That's the only thing that really... So it has more species. Okay. This is one that we get all around the coast on EP. If you go to Streaky Bay, it, you'll see them at the caravan park in the trees all day, down in Port Lincoln, Tumby. They sit up in the trees and then about, just before dusk, you'll see them take off out of the trees and fly down to the coast and they'll spend all night feeding along the coast. And then back in the morning, they're back in the trees again. No? They've got the much stockier, so they're not the egrets, they're not the herons. In, in the, they're down towards the bitten side of it. They're just a little bit different from the bitterns. Night herons, yeah. They are at, at different coast. parts along the coast, yep. Uh, Streaky Bay, Venus Bay, Sejuna, um, 
Where else have I seen them? Tumby Bay, Port Lincoln. And I'm, I'd swear they'd be... Yeah. Where there's mangroves, you'll find them resting up in the mangroves. This is not the, the full adult. Juvenile plumage. Nankeen night heron. Some books will have Rufus night heron. Juvenile. So, you've seen them? Good man. If, if you're down uh, the primary school just behind the Baptist church, they used to fly out of those trees uh, just opposite the post office there, those big trees through there. If you know what you're looking for uh, during the day, the just opposite the post office, the trees that run uh, up away from the, the bay, near the tourist um, information. They roost in the trees. Yeah, they roost in the trees all during the day. You, and if you're at Streaky Bay at the caravan park, those trees that run along the front of the caravan park, there's lots in there. If you start looking with your binos, you'll find them. They're just sitting still. And then late in the afternoon they'll go. As I look over the Torres and Bob, they're very absent. They're a huge one. Sorry, they're very absent. Is that the one that cause all the trouble with the tanks? Ah, yeah, they do. Um, they, and cars under the trees. Yeah, because they're sitting there all day digesting their food and then... <laughs> yeah, and they feed all night along the shoreline. Yep. Night heron. And keen night heron. Oh, reasonable size. Yep. Okay. Right, you've got your 10 seconds before you fire your shot. You've ID'd it and you've made your decision. And having pulled the trigger, you realise that you're in really big trouble. No, 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 no. Look at that bill. Big, strong bill and then flattens out. Look under the wings. Which has the white in the wing? Yep. So that those underwing covets are white. You got that nice triangular pattern. Yeah. Identifying them on the water is very different from identifying them in the air. Yep. You've got that nice distinct triangle. That head is very distinctive. Freckled duck again. The male has that really red triangle, yeah. Nope. This is another call of wetlands. Yeah, because we're trying to learn all of them in the book. That's, yeah, there you go, you're in the right part of the world. Yep. 
Dusky Moorhead. If you get to see that bill, there's nothing else that has that red and then yellow. You can see the wing of this hasn't started to form yet. So you can see that the, the primaries and the secondaries haven't even started to grow yet. It's just the, the alula sticking down and, and, and the bones. So a real chicken wing. Dusky Moorhen, everyone's happy? No. 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 This is the one that people often get confused and they write the wrong one down quite regularly. So think about it very carefully. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. You don't often see the beak that colour. Yep. It's a diving duck. It's not that common. If you've got them out on a lake and you're looking, scanning for the different ducks, these are really annoying because they keep going under and they're under longer than they're up. Seeing one that you thought? I wasn't too sure, yeah. Yep, you, you get them over here. We had them the last few years. Okay. Um, when on a little wetland there? We had like three wet years in a row yeah. and they moved in. And there's okay. heaps of different ducks and that, and we've seen some of them. I've seen them on the sewage ponds at um, uh, just, just out of Port Lincoln, just north of Port Lincoln, what's it called? North Shields, the sewage ponds there. That, if you ever get a chance, the sewage ponds there are brilliant for all sorts of ducks. Worth a worth trip. Yeah. Well, if you do, the other people will be birders, so it's okay. Um, if you're going towards the airport, just at, at the very beginning of North Shields, the road goes off to the left, which is called Murray Drive, and about 2k out there on the right-hand side, there's a series of ponds. Uh, no, you, you... Yeah, right next to there. Right. Yes. Oh, to, to turn off, yes. Yes. Just before the 60. Yes. And that's really good for all sorts of ducks. I, I've seen a huge variety out there, um, including quite a few rare ones. Um, crackled duck, bluebill, that sort of thing. Uh, you get hardheads there, you get... Um, yeah, quite, quite a few species. Okay, so bluebill duck, the tail's quite distinctive, but and, and the size and shape is fairly obvious if you get... But you don't often see that blue bill. So you've got to be sure it's not a female muskie and, and other things like that. So it, it's quite, quite distinctive if you start to think about all the little elements. I do, that's the entire intent. Whistler, Whistler duck. The, the entire intent of this is that by the end of the course you know this Leary book inside out. You have flipped back and forwards. How many times do you reckon you've done it so far this particular evening? Enough. Enough. <laughs> Sorry? Can it's got no. the um, yellow beak and the black legs. Yeah, but too, too, too big and long a neck. Cattle egret is, is a bit smaller. Oh, okay. 
If you look here, you can tell it apart from, from the great, but that's really hard to see. The key thing is, if I measure the length of that neck and lay it along the body, the body's a little bit longer. Not much, just a little bit. That's the intermediate. It's not the great, it's the intermediate. Now, these birds really plummeted in number during the 90s and 2000s because they didn't breed along the Murray-Darling system. The only place they were breeding in southern Australia was down on the Barwon River, down in the wetlands at the end of the Barwon system. So because they need that really long period of water under their nest, they need nine months of water. So how, how, how long will a bird or how live for? They live for 20 or 30 years or maybe, even, yeah, but after 20 years you're looking at most of the population having senesced and it's only the really young ones that are coming through. Up north they've done okay because they still get all the floods up north but down south there was one reported on Air Peninsula last year so keep an eye out. But intermediate egret. And if you do look at that head, if you get a good look, notice how there's only a little flick there, it doesn't go right back, it's not a big long mark. Okay, intermediate. How about this guy? Hey, Baron Goose. Now these were really endangered going back 30 years ago. They're really common now. They're not really common, they're more common. But in Western Australia, they're still very uncommon. Right next so, door to the airport, there's like a block of like 40 or 50 yep. in one group. And there was and about six or 700 on there. Big Swamp yeah. earlier this year. So, yeah. But they're still not out of the woods yet. And that's the sad part. When their numbers start to increase again, back to something that might be a little bit healthy, of course, they eat green picks. So they're, they're, they're really impacting on some farmers. And, and it's a really tricky thing to play. <laughs> they breed on the offshore islands, which is why they've been successful. But they have, they have a challenging time on the offshore islands because the young have to grow quick enough and be able to fly off before everything dries out, before they run out of water on the offshore islands and run out of green pick. And then if they don't get that nice long spring, then they die on the islands, so that you, you lose a lot of them there. If they do make it to the mainland, you often see a lot of dead young along the coast because they, they fly in and out every day. So there's demands on them that are, that are great energetically. But so yeah. Um, so no, no, they're coming to feed and then they're off again each night. Well, don't get them fly over Port Lincoln, but if you're down at North Shields and places like that, you get to see them fly out each night, uh, Tumby Bay. Yeah. And they honk. They're one of our few geese. Uh, we've got a few very small ones up north, pygmy geese, but they're one of Lake Hamilton. Lake Hamilton, okay. And yeah, east and west coast. So Air Peninsula is. Yep. And we get them down breeding on the islands offshore of the Coorong, that, that part of the world. Um, anyway, I, I've seen them out on a lot of the islands, even out on Rocky Island, right yeah, down south. Yeah, down Greenley. And Greenley, yeah. 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 Um, so they do get around and all along the coast. Yeah. Oh, the part that impresses me about Rocky Island is the seagulls breeding there. And if you've ever seen a seagull nest, how do you get that many branches on Rocky Island? Mm, yeah. Interesting. Is that 200 years worth of effort? One branch a year. So Cape Barren Goose. <laughs> they hadn't been recorded around the lower lakes uh, sorry, the, the lower lakes in Kurong for years and years and years. And we did a survey around there over a couple of years and we recorded three, but we never saw them. I, I had one there. And that black line there is not a reed. 
Not a shadow. And they stand there with their head up like that. This is their call. Hear it? Now, in theory, they're on our peninsula. I haven't heard one here, but I'd really like to know if there's one. And you're not going to see it. No. Hear it? Just? There's one worse than this. I'll play you for in a sec. It's not this species, it's a closely related species. So you're out in the wetland and you hear this distant, dull sort of call. But the worst one is this guy. You just sort of feel the air vibrate. You do? And you're thinking, something not quite right. That one? Just a really deep. Mm. Mm. So it sounds like a frog, doesn't it? <laughs> mm. Just a really deep background. Yeah. Well done. Little bit. No, it's really. Put your hand on it. Put your hand on the iPad, just underneath it. Try it. Just put your hand underneath it. It's really deep. It's just at the bottom of our hearing. And you're out there in the wetlands and you sort of you can feel this, but you have no idea it's near and you have no idea where it is. No, this is the Australian one. But that one's the little one. <laughs> you feel it there. <laughs> Same again. Put your hand underneath it and just feel the, the iPad vibrating. And if you really think about it, you can hear it as well. That's the Australian one. Uh, uh, sorry, the, no, no, that we I played the little one before. So the little one you can hear a bit more distinctly. It's, it's a bit more distinct. But that Australian um, bitten is quite a deal different. So this is the little bitten, the Australian little bitten. And they're probably a bit more common than people think. You just don't see them. You're not going to see them. You've got to hear them. Now, yeah. 
same similar because I've got a completely different surname. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it'll be about skeletal structures and, and DNA. Yeah, and it looks longer, whereas the Australian spitting looks like more washed up. Uh, um, yeah, they're, they're quite distinctive in their habitat use. And, and they're, but yeah, they, they're. Yeah, I, I can pull out the I can pull out the key differences for you, um, but they they're not going to be something you're going to be able to see distinctly. When when you look at this guy, those stripes that you've got down the, the length of the body, they're very different from the bitten patterns. Yeah. So the little bitten, you've got those distinctive stripes right down the body. And you're not going to see that in, in your... Um, but I guess the key point is you're not going to see this guy very often. You, you'll see the, the Rufus night heron or Nankin night heron, whatever you want to call it. Um, you'll see that quite regularly. But you won't see this guy very regularly at all. No, I know that map's not good. Other books show it, but that map's no good. And you'll dis you'll discover that that there are weaknesses in all these books, the strengths as well. But yeah. yep, and they are here because I've seen them all over EP. Okay, we're running out of time, sadly. Sorry, we were a bit too long down at the. Um, Yes, I'll, I'll, when, when I finish, the, I'll run through the last few slides. So this one you see along the coast, we don't see the white one so often. We see a grey one typically right around the coast. A reef egret? A reef egret. As, you go, as you go north, you seem to see the white ones a lot more often than the, the grey ones. Um, so that's eastern reef egret and that's the white morph of it. Next one is a shoveler, very distinctive, strong beak, quite obvious in profile on a wetland, a bigger duck, an Australasian shoveler. These guys are highly eruptive. They appear when we get good rains and there'll be green pick everywhere and you'll get hundreds and hundreds of them. Yeah, and if they burst out when you fly, and they do funny things. You'll see big lines of them walking, and yeah, um, you be out in the desert in the middle of absolutely nowhere, and there'll be a rain a week ago or something, and suddenly you'll see hundreds of these birds across the desert. Really weird. Very distinctive markings, and, and yep. Yeah, um, so black-tailed native hen. This guy is one of my favourite birds. The glossy ibis. We had four or five of them down on a big swamp last year. So look around, you'll see them now and then. These feathers, remember we talked about the physical coloration and we talked about the iridescent type of coloration? So they can look very bland and brown and then they'll turn into the light and bang, you get that. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. They, they really are a pretty bird. Glossy eyes. When you see their head, they've got beautiful white markings on the head that give really lovely patterns. This guy, yeah, they really do weird things when they're feeding. You'll get two or three of them spinning in a circle, head down, tail up, and they'll create a whirlpool. And it sort of brings food in from all over the pond and they'll sit there feeding together, spinning around in a circle. Have that really distinctive beak. They have the little pink that gives them their name, but you don't see that unless you get close and it's bright sunlight or you're looking through a telescope. 
They used to be called zebra ducks for obvious reasons and that's the key feature, that's what you'll see, that, that zebra patterning, that's the first thing you'll see. The pink haired duck, the black around the eye. Okay, this next one, the, um, this is the one that makes the spotless crake have its name. And this is the spotted crake, distinctive call. You hear that through wetlands? But again, tucked away in reed beds, don't see them out very often. When you do see them out, they look a lot like the spotless crake unless you get them in the bright sunshine. Okay, so you need to look carefully if you're going to try and tell them apart visually. When they do jump out into the sunshine out of the shady reeds, that it's a bit more easily seen. But remember, the spotless crake had the brown and grey as well and, and often just looked quite a dark bird. Uh, so, Australian spotted crake. Then, Spoonbills and the ibis, so Australian white ibis and royal spoonbill. And what they call this? Um, the dunchooks, they've taken over severely. Ah, oh, the white ibis, yes. Yeah. Dunchooks. <laughs> this guy, you can see it's pied, but it's got the white through above the eye and hasn't got the really intense colouring, so that's a little pied. Yeah. And this guy, they call them the hardheads because they're so hard to shoot. They keep flying even when they've got a lot of lead in them. Quite, quite distinctive eye and the white on the beak and that very distinctive colouring. There's also a little bit of white on the undertail coverts but you don't see that as easily. Until you see the white, you can actually pick them but you need to, the white of the eyes, you, you've, you've got to look fairly closely, particularly when you get that shine on the water and that sort of thing. But hard heads. And that's it, sorry. Um, it's, can we um, clean up our glasses and... Uh,